Good afternoon. My name is Diana Hess. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm very pleased to be the chair and moderator for the session uh, Growing Up Divided. This is a rather remarkable project that uh, looked at uh, young people in three societies, South Africa, the United States, and Northern Ireland. Uh, at the time the project was conceived and was being executed, I was working at the Spencer Foundation, and one of my jobs was to work on an initiative called the New Civics Initiative. And this study was one of the studies that was part of this initiative. So I've got to say, I've got this uh, phenomenal feeling right now to watch this uh, studies come to fruition, to learn about the findings when it was so many years ago uh, when I was watching it being developed. So without any further ado, let me tell you a little bit about the session. At the beginning, we're going to have several pretty brief presentations from researchers about their work and their findings about how young people grow up in divided societies and how issues of division affect their sense of civic engagement and their understanding of democracy. And in the second part of the session, we'll have time for questions and answers. First, we're gonna have a very brief introduction of the project writ large by co-project director Sarah Friedman. Co-project director Karen Murphy will talk about some of the divisions in these societies. Then Jaron Shin and Dennis Barr will explain the results of surveys of student senses of civic engagement. After that, Zina Besaravich and Sarah Friedman will provide two examples from the United States of students' civic development with a focus on effective supports in schools and families. And finally, presuming the technology gods want to shine on us, we will hear from project collaborators in Northern Ireland and South Africa via video about their work with teachers, their focus on helping teachers teach adolescents about their civic responsibilities in the field, in the face of growing up divided. I also want to, before we start the presentations, welcome and acknowledge and ask him to stand, David uh, Bromfeld, who worked with this team on the project and has been a core part of the uh, effective execution of it. So without any further ado, could you join me in welcoming the co-project director, Sarah Friedman. Thank you, Diana, and thanks so much to the Spencer Foundation. Of course, without Spencer, none of this would have happened. Um, so our session is going to report on how secondary school students in divided societies develop as democratic citizens and civic actors. We also consider the role that their teachers and schools and communities play in their development. Although there are many divisions within societies, we're focusing mainly on particular ones that have led to violent conflicts and which have threatened and which continue to threaten the stability of democracy. Our study, as Diana mentioned, is based in three divided societies, Northern, Ar Northern Ireland, South Africa, and the United States. We consider the ways that young people from different ones of the divided groups in each country navigate the legacies of division that they have inherited. Now, Northern Ireland's conflict is ethno-nationalist with territory at the center. Our subjects and others often shorthand the conflict by referring to it as Protestant versus Catholic. Those who call themselves loyalists or unionists are generally Protestant and want to remain part of the United Kingdom. And those who call themselves nationalist or Republican are generally Catholic and want Northern Ireland to be part of the Republic of Ireland. In South Africa and the United States, the divisions are generally associated with histories of racial and ethnic violence and oppression. In all three countries, the divisions are related in complex ways to socioeconomic inequalities. Now, in this study, we followed some 1,600 young people's civic development in the three countries across grades nine through 12. Um, facing history in ourselves, an international educational and teacher education nonprofit 
provided the context and a network of partners for our study. All the teachers that we worked with had had some training and used some facing history resources and methods with their students in their history or civics courses. With particular attention to developing informed, compassionate, and active citizens with a knowledge of history and of societal divisions. Our data include focus groups, interviews, intensive study of focal students in case study schools. And we've, in each country, we chose settings that represented the diversity of these societies. This qualitative data provides information across time about the development of students who sit on varied sides of the divides. And we also collected surveys that offer a snapshot at a moment in time, mostly grades 9 and 10, that complement the qualitative data. Now, at, what we're going to do is after each, each talk, we're going to pause for a minute for you to write your response and to write your question so that you can keep it all together, because this is a really big project and it's complicated. And so we want to try to draw things together here. And I hope that you'll help us with that. Um, I'm going to now turn to Karen for our first presentation. She will provide more information on these three divided societies. Hi, I'm going to describe three critical incidents that occurred during our study that shed light on the divisions within Northern Ireland, South Africa, and the United States. The incidents illuminate legacies of the primary historical conflicts that we explore, apartheid and its legacies in South Africa, the Troubles and its legacies in Northern Ireland, and racial violence and segregation in the United States. The students overwhelmingly viewed these events from the perspectives of their identity groups. Their views were reinforced by school and residential segregation, as well as their historical understanding and awareness, how they were taught and what they were taught, their own life experiences, which included communal and familial relationships and narratives. The narrow focus of most students limited their abilities to see the particular event from the perspective of their co-citizens, specifically of those who were victims of historical violence, oppression, and inequality or it got in the way of their abilities to understand how other people in their society think and feel and what inspires their civic actions and reactions. It also inhibited their abilities to be civic problem solvers and to imagine a greater good. I'm going to talk about students who stood out from the majority. These students shed light on some of the promising practices and experiences that we identify in our study that help them develop as democratic civic actors and that we will discuss later in the session. I will now turn to the critical incident in Northern Ireland. On 3 December 2012, Belfast City Council voted to limit the number of days that the flag of the United Kingdom would fly from Belfast City Hall. The new policy said the flag would fly no more than 18 days per year, in keeping with the wider British policy. The decision sparked protests, rioting, and violence with many of the mostly Protestant loyalists and unionists involved, arguing that the flag decision was part of a larger attack on Britishness. The protests lasted for four months. 160 police officers were injured, and policing operations cost the province 22 million pounds. The students' experiences in our case study and focus group schools have mostly been segregated. In segregated schools, and their experiences outside of school have largely been with one of the dominant communities, Protestant or Catholic, and that's the shorthand these kids use. The majority of students talked as if they are outside of the conflict and of history. Many aspire to be beyond identity itself as they affiliate it with conflict. There was a common disgust with politicians and politics, and an ambivalence about the past and the way it seemed to both loom and feel elusive. Steve, a student in our case study classroom, stood out. Through his church youth group, he attended an event tied to the peace process led by US diplomat Richard Haas. And he met and importantly heard and listened to victims of the conflict from across communities. Such experiences helped him think about point of view. He explicitly engaged with his friends with this lens in mind. He said, sort of like, you know, what I was saying about the friend group in school, we talk about, you know, things that are happening. There's a couple of guys, they do politics, so they're more into it. And we talk about different things that have happened. And there's sort of a mixture of people there about. And I think of saying, so I'm a Protestant, so this is my view of something. And I'm a Catholic, so this is my view of something. It's looking at it, but this is what we need to do to fix it. 
Steve goes on to say that people need to call out sectarian bigotry when they witness it. He also recognized he is part of the conflict, saying most people, they don't really want to be associated with the conflict and its legacies, but they still are, even if they don't want to be. In South Africa, it began as a strike by rock drill operators at a mine in Maracana. 3,000 workers walked off the job on 10 August. It became increasingly violent and included policemen, security personnel from the mine, and a growing rivalry between labor mines. 10 people were killed in the early days of the strike, including two police officers and two security personnel. On Thursday, 16 August, the South African Police Service fired automatic weapons into a crowd of miners. 34 people were killed, 78 were injured, and 259 were arrested. The police claimed that they were attacked by miners carrying clubs, machetes, and spears. Some police killings were captured by media, showing that some of the strikers did not present a threat to the police at all. What became known as the Maracana Massacre quickly spread across South Africa and the world via media and social media, and many immediately made the connection to the Sharpeville Massacre of 1960. The students at the primarily white, upper middle class Cape Town Boys School struggled to empathize with the miners, and they viewed Maracana primarily from the perspective of the mine owners. They showed a greater willingness to think about their thinking and challenge each other in other conversations. This one was marked by insensitivity. The students at Township High, the other focus group school, who are all black, responded with critical empathy and understanding informed by an intimate identification they made with the miners. They often used the language of family to talk about what happened. They sounded, as one of the members of our adult group said, like they were from another country when compared to the students at Cape Town Boys. Aaliyah, from our case study school, Fine Boss, married her history education, civic engagement, and experience of border crossing, generationally and cross-communally, in her understanding of events. The way that I've studied history and the way that I've just seen or observed world events, I feel that sometimes democracy and all these ideas are greater in theory than in practice. In the beginning, after the revolution, and after you've rid of your old oppressive regime, you have a utopia and don't feel any incentive to put in any hard work. I think a lot of South Africans have that attitude until it's someone in my family who was killed in a massacre, or until this affects my wages. I'm not bothered. We have our generations who survived apartheid and are still living. And within that generation, you have those that were for the apartheid regime and still haven't come out of that and come to terms with the new democracy. And we've got our generation, who was born two years into democracy, but we've never felt that racism that our parents felt. We've never felt that oppression, so we don't know how to be grateful for what we have. And we are basically taking our freedom for granted. Aaliyah went on to talk about the role of community service in her school and the profound effect it had on her, particularly in light of her history education. She volunteered in a senior center and worked with people who lived through apartheid. Words on a page can be anything, she said, but just speaking to those people and listening to these stories, I felt, you know, this is actually real. The United States. Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old black male. In February 2012, he was visiting his father in Florida. On the 26th, he went to a local convenience store to buy drink, a drink, and candy. On his way home, he was seen by George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch captain, who called 911 to report seeing Martin. Zimmerman followed Martin, and an altercation occurred between them. Zimmerman shot and killed Martin. Afterward, Zimmerman claimed that the killing was self-defense. Media worldwide covered Martin's killing. His death also sparked protests, primarily by black Americans. Zimmerman was acquitted by a jury trial in July 2013. His acquittal was also met with protests, led primarily by black Americans. The black and Latinx students in our focus group at New York City High School were more aware of, concerned about, and made connections to Martin's killing in their own lives than their wealthier white and Latinx peers at Grasslands, our other focus group school. Pete from Magnet High, our diverse but mostly black case study school, is white. He reflected on his whiteness, on the complexities of history, and his racial inheritance. His thinking was also shaped by going to a diverse school. 
referring to a speech by President Obama on the Zimmerman verdict in which the president talked about the sometimes unacknowledged frustration felt by many black Americans, Pete said, I wouldn't say it's unacknowledged, I'd say it's non-believed. He then drew on Peggy McIntosh's invisible knapsack, which he read in class, to explain his thinking. Raising white superiority in his analysis, he listed a range of small ways privilege manifests and his surprise at its ongoing denial. It's right there, he said. It's like these very minor things in our society just build up and it's very frustrating. At the, not just the naivete, but also the stubbornness of it. Talking about his white family, their racism, and his white neighborhood, he said, I go to school primarily with black people. I'm a minority there, and you cannot say something about people you don't know. These students and their peers help us to understand how they perceive and interpret the complex issues they have inherited. They help us to recognize, better understand, and learn how to support the skills of thinking about one's thinking, acting with a sense of civic mutuality, and drawing on history to navigate the present through out-of-school experiences when in-school experiences are lacking, through meaningful civic action projects, through experiencing integrated spaces and relationships, through reading about and understanding the legacies of divisions, including privilege, and through challenging conversations. Dennis Barr and Jared Shin will now talk about findings from the surveys after you take just a second to write some comments and questions perhaps you have for my talk. Okay, um, thank you, Karen, for vividly uh, contextualizing the project. Um, now, Dennis and I will uh, unpack what quantitative data tell us by reporting our cross and within country analysis result. Um, the guiding question for this part of the project is the following. What are similarities and differences in civic engagement within and across Northern Ireland, South Africa, and the United States? In order to answer to this question, we created a civic engagement survey that encompasses uh, both psychological and behavior dimensions of adolescents' civic life in and out of school. The survey consists of seven scales comprised of 98, 97 items, and these items focused on uh, students' civic dispositions, uh, participation, and learning opportunities. More specifically, uh, seven conceptual scales we used included civic responsibility, public interest goals, self-interest goals, uh, tolerance, civic self-efficacy, civic participation, and classroom climate and civic learning opportunities. All of the survey items and scales were first developed in the US and were validated. And to adapt the surveys for students in Northern Ireland and South Africa, we worked with local researchers to be sure all measures were culturally appropriate. But in all cases, we were faithful to the original survey in as much as pos was possible and made all three surveys as par parallel as possible. Many scales were from surveys designed by other researchers investigating particular civic constructs, and some of the surveys were, uh, we benefited from were on the slide. <laughs> Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, show you, but they okay. were included. Yeah. Joe Kahn, Connie Flanagan, Patricia Avery, um, and, and others. Yes. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we surveyed 293 students in Belfast and in its surround in Northern Ireland, 342 students in Cape Town and its surround in South Africa, and 585 students in seven different regions in the United States. They were in the uh, equivalent of grade nine or 10 and attended both public and private schools and lived in rural, suburban, and urban settings with different ethnic or religious and socioeconomic demographics. Uh, all had been taught by teachers trained by facing history and ourselves and used its materials. Uh, here's more specific information about demographic breakdowns. In Northern Ireland, students were asked to identify themselves as Protestant, Catholic, or uh, they were also given the opportunity to name another identity group. 
in South Africa and in the US, the students were asked to choose their race or ethnicity. In South Africa, they were given four options, including black, colored, white, and the opportunity to name another identity group. And in the US, they were given categories such as Latinx, African American, white, Asian, Native American, and the opportunity to name another identity group. All study participants uh, were also asked if they were males or females. Their socioeconomic status was classified by eligibility of free meals, school neighborhood, or parents' education levels depending on country. We ran both cross and within country analysis. Uh, before we describe our analytic strategy, we want to acknowledge the significant contribution and ongoing guidance of Ingram, Ingram Alkin, the well-known award-winning statistician from Stanford, who passed away soon after we completed our analysis. Uh, we want to dedicate this analysis to him, as we couldn't have done it uh, without him. To compare the general civic engagement of the youth in each country, we combined the seven scales of civic engagement and created a civic engagement mega score for each student by using principal component analysis results. We then used both an unpaired t-test and a telling t squared uh, square to compare Northern Irish, South African, and the US youth, youth's general civic engagement. To further analyze the contribution of the three demographic variables to each student's civic engagement, we performed a um, multivariate analysis of variance uh, for each country. We also examined both, interaction, uh, both uh, possible interactions between demographic variables. Now, Dennis will uh, discuss the result of this analysis. No slides, that's fine. Um, I wanted to acknowledge also that we have one of our local research partners in the audience, Tony Gallagher, who contributed to the study as well. It's great to see you. The main cross-country results reveal that young people showed significantly different levels of civic engagements in the three countries in our study. The most civically engaged youth, according to our measures, were from South Africa. Even though young people in South Africa, as Karen pointed out, live in different worlds, depending on the divisions in the society, they are on the whole more civically engaged than those in the other two countries. Their parents live during apartheid, and some participated to bring the entrenched apartheid government to an end. The apartheid legacy might have influenced young people to value the right to vote and the importance of democratic institutions, since democratic processes were denied to so many for so long, and since civic action was ensured, um, ensured was what ensured democratic rights for all. On the ex other extreme sits Northern Ireland, where, as Karen pointed out, young people have been more detached from the civic space, just wanting their conflict to go away, even though they still long linger. Young people from the US sit in the middle. Our interviews with US students provide a possible interpretation of this finding. We found that US students, compared to their South African counterparts, seemed more complacent about the strength of their democracy and seemed less aware of what it took to uphold the democracy. Now let's turn to the analysis of differences within each country. In all three countries, girls reported significantly stronger engagement than boys. The gender effect stood out more consistently than SES or the major socio-political divides that drove the violence in the three societies. <clears throat> South Africa's patterns with respect to gender differences are slightly different from those in the US and Northern Ireland, with only two scales, civic responsibility and public interest goals driving the gender finding. In contrast, the patterns for gender in, US, in the US and Northern Ireland were quite similar to one another, such that girls scored higher than boys on almost all of our seven scales. Of most interest with respect to the socio-political divides is the fact that the racial divides explain levels of civic engagement in South Africa and the US, while being Catholic or Protestant does not do so in Northern Ireland. Although in Northern Ireland there was little, there was little mingling across groups, both sides seem to be equally disaffected. Now we turn to SES. Although racial group membership explained levels of young people's civic engagement in the US, SES did not predict their civic engagement. However, socioeconomic status did explain levels of civic engagement in the other two countries. 
It's possible that the US results are an artifact of how SES was measured, which was asking students about their parents' education. At, uh, at the same time, it's also possible that when inequalities due to race persist across lo a long period of time, as has been in the US, identity group membership is a strong predictor of civic engagement, while SES was not significant in our study. We now turn to Zena and Sarah, who will move from this snapshot in time to talk about the dynamics of civic development for two young people in the US during their secondary school years. And again, if you have some questions or thoughts, please just take a moment to write it down, and we'll come to you at the end. All right, hi, everyone. Um, can we take just a minute for you to write questions that you've got about the surveys so that you can pull those up during the question and answer? Just Okay, so um, for the next part, we really, truly did depend on technology. Um, and what we wanted to do is actually bring you the voices of the youth that, um, that we did our um, research with and who participated in, in the study. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to continue playing the presenter. And Sarah is going to be the kids. <laughs> so we'll see how this role play is going to work. Um, so we'll now turn to the civic development of two of the case study students from our US case study school magnet. These students show the different developmental paths young people take and how a strong curriculum and community accommodate and nurture them along the way. The first, at this point we would have pictures for you of the two students. The first, um, Gabriella, is the daughter of immigrants from Mexico born just after her parents arrived in the US. Her family struggled financially. Always an outstanding student, she was bullied in middle school and entered Magnet afraid to speak her thoughts out loud. After seeking help, she gradually healed from bullying and began to speak. Our second case study is Tyler. He's a middle-class African-American male who did well in middle school but became progressively more and more disengaged in high school well into his 11th grade year, and much to his teachers and family's dismay. Always want to take responsibility, Tyler turned himself around after 11th grade and began to fulfill his potential. Gabriella's developmental journey to speaking out required that she both heal from the bullying, which included losing that fear of her peers, and coming to believe that her voice mattered. In grade nine, Gabriella realized she needed help and went to the school counselor, who sent her to an outside psychologist. With a great deal of support from both counselors, who also got her family on board, therapy helped her understand that the bullying had left a debilitating mark and that she could trust her new peers. In grade 10, she showed her new emerging self. Let's listen to her. I'm like, let me cross that boundary, I guess. Let me branch out and like, let me talk to people. Let me be a little louder. Let me like say what I feel. Maybe I shouldn't keep it all inside. Maybe I should say what I feel, even though nobody may care. At least it's out there. Gabriella's school also helped her cross that boundary to talking. All students chose, planned, and organized the 12th grade civic action project. She chose an anti-bullying project, which she designed with a peer and implemented at her old middle school where she was bullied. In her civic action, she continued to work through her personal traumas and chose to help others experiencing <coughs> such traumas. 
When we asked, she explained her sense of civic action and the process showing how her personal experiences with bullying shaped her views. I think what it takes to be a good citizen is that, is that you have to help your, your community, yourself, your people, and the ones around you. You have to um, become a part of your community, be a part, a citizen of your community, and help as much as you can. Help others as much as you can, and others will help you as much as they can. It's important to notice that though she was beginning to think of others, she remained focused on her community and on the personal benefits of civic action. In other conversations, we learned that as a Latina, she felt blacks got more attention than Latinx, and she felt a need to protect her group. She had difficulty empathizing with the traumas of other groups. With the support she got, Gabriella ended <clears throat> ended up graduating at the top of her class and going to an Ivy League school and continuing her civic journey. We'll now move on to um, our second case study, Tyler. Um, Tyler's developmental journey required him to learn to have faith in himself and his academic potential and potential to change his society. To understand that potential, he had to find his civic voice and role in the change process. He had to learn how social structures could be changed, and he had to understand how academic achievement connected with and could facilitate change. Unlike Gabriella, he came to Magnet with many coping strategies to, do, to depersonalize negative experiences, in particular the way he was treated in U.S. society as an African-American male. I believe I anticipate it when I get in an elevator and there's like this little old white lady or like old like lady who is clutching her pocketbook like I'm going to take it from her. I kind of like get in an elevator and I stand to the other side so you don't have any feelings of fear toward me or aggression. So I just politely say, hello, or how are you doing? And then we ask, what helps you deal with that? He says, me, my personality. I kind of laugh at it because it's like stupidity on their part. I don't feel like it's something that should be taken seriously because I take it seriously, but in the moment I laugh at it. Because it's like you still have that mindset where I'm a threat to you, and we should be equal. Tyler's biggest challenge was his academic performance. He was aware of the implications. When confronted in ninth and 10th grade, he kept saying he would try to do better, but showed no progress. The adults in his life, mother, teachers, family, friends, never let up. Tyler was not changing his achievement patterns, but he was listening all along. He knew that he had to decide to do the work himself in order to change his ways, but the persistence of the adults was crucial. In 12th grade, he explained who inspires him. He says, myself, I actually inspired myself more than others to, the, to do the right thing. I only listen to myself at the end of the day, like, I have the choice. Then he says, it was, people, it was people around me, like adults who wanted, who saw the potential that I have. And they like wanted to make sure that I fulfilled that potential. And they wanted to make sure that I knew what my self-worth was. So I think feeding off them, I began to see that potential that they saw and see that I could achieve great things if I put myself in the position to achieve those things. Even before he began to change his achievement patterns, there were signs that he was trying. So in grade 11, he changed his friendship group. I've added new friends to my circle because I've changed the people I hang around with based on where they're planning on going in life based on the comparison between me and them. And then I've changed people I hang around with. I've cut some people off, or like, you know, based on like what their ambitions are. 
By 12th grade, though, Tyler decided to focus on his schoolwork to fulfill his potential. This decision coincided with his social action project that had a personal grounding, but also addressed a major societal problem related to the divided society he inhabits. He explains that he wanted to create change by getting out the black youth vote. I recently turned 18 in April. So when I chose my action project, it extended from that. So I became eligible. I registered and I looked at the numbers and people were at City Hall talking about they wish more youth would come in and register to vote. And I took that from them. So then I, this year, this month, I went to this community college in my town and I gave a presentation about the importance of youth voting and gave them instructions on how to register to vote. And yeah, it went pretty well. And indeed, it wasn't just the project that went well. Tyler was accepted by one of the historically black colleges where he has thrived. In conclusion, um, what we wanted to draw attention to is that many have written about microaggressions, and for sure, they're there and they're important. But what leads to development in good schools are the supports. In studying civic development, we see the importance of not just microaggressions, but also of micro and macro supports. For macro supports, a school that includes good counselors and a curriculum with lots of support for understanding oneself and one's world and that leads to action projects. For micro supports, the recognition and countering of the microaggressions, as well as the persistent communication by the adults that we've seen around Taylor of his potential and the ongoing support Gabriella received to speak up. Allowing these students to take what are sometimes small steps and go in their own chosen directions the, slow, the slowness of voicing even tentative opinions for Gabriella, and the long road to taking responsibility and acting on it across the years for Tyler. These were crucial for their more major developmental achievements. Please join me in thanking our presenters. So we have about a half an hour, and we're going to divide the time we have into two distinct sessions. I've asked Daniel to pass out a handout that has three overall conclusions from this very complex and multifaceted study. As the handout is coming around, you'll notice that the first conclusion is that empathetic learning across identity groups is necessary but insufficient for development. The second conclusion is that learning about threats to democracy is necessary but insufficient for development. And the third finding is that schools can create structures to help all young people develop as ethical and democratic citizens and civic actors. What we'd like you to do is find a partner or if you would like to work with a smaller group, team up with three or four other people. And we'd like you to spend about 15 minutes thinking about the presentations that you just heard, referring to the handout that has three of the overall conclusions, and talking with your partner about what you think it means, about any questions you have, about how what you've just heard relates or does not relate to your own sense of what it means to grow up in a divided society. So again, if you could please find a partner, and I'm gonna give you about 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you very much. If you have a question, I'm going to ask you to stand up and in your very best teacher voice, introduce yourself, your name, and where you're from, and then ask your question. I'll repeat it just to make sure that it's being picked up, and then we'll uh, have at least one of the panelists respond to it. So who would like to start with the first question? Thank you. Stand up, please. Hi, I'm Samia, and I'm a doctoral student at Columbia. Uh, I'm wondering, after this intensive work that you've undertaken in all these three respective sites, uh, what's next? What is the way forward? Wait, was that loud enough <laughs> to our AV yeah. people? No. Okay, so here's the question, which was, I thought, a great question, was after this intensive work that this team has done, as, as you can imagine, for many years, what's next? 
What are you planning to do as a consequence or to follow up on this step? So I'll tell you a couple things and then um, Sarah will. So one thing is Sarah and I are, are working on a book. Um, another thing is I work for Facing History in Ourselves and so does Dennis. I direct the international work. So some of our findings are going into the work that we do in these countries, including the United States. So there's a, a real practical implication. Um, and then the third thing is already when we were learning things, we were sharing them often because we were talking to a group of adult educators and scholars and so on. So we know that one teacher, for example, a magnet, um, upon learning that um, her students, for example, knew nothing about the Voting Rights Act, okay, which surprised her. You know, it's this group of kids who were pretty plugged into the civil rights movement and able to talk about many things. And you have this critical thing happening in the summer of 2013 in terms of the Supreme Court of the United States did, taking it apart. And they were just sort of like, what? what? No. And so that both spoke volumes about uh, a common US absence in terms of not knowing that history and also not knowing much about the recent Supreme Court decision. So what she did when she went back into the next academic year was create a program where they began to study the civil rights movement. They used um, John Lewis and his story as a through line. And it really began actually with um, the Ferguson, Michael Brown was just killed, and there were the protests in Ferguson. So they were able to really start there, use John Lewis, and personalize, uh, in some ways, this semester long course. And the kids were very plugged in. Now, I will also say that because of where we are in our democracy right now, um, the kids are in a very different place in terms of their knowledge about democratic norms and processes and institutions. Would anyone else on the panel like to respond? I, I'll, just, I'll just say a couple words about the book that we're working on. Um, we're, we're hoping to use, use the data as an opportunity to kind of look for the glimmers of hope and the, the places where something has been effective and has really influenced kids to change. Because we did see kind of remarkable examples of civic development, different types of civic development. And so we're hoping to look carefully at those, the supports that enable that civic development. And it's hard to communicate in a, a short speech what that support really looked like. But in the book, we hope to really spin out what it takes to um, help kids move forward in terms of civic development. Great, so we now have a microphone, so if you could just stand up and go to the mic, that way I don't have to take up the time and repeating the question. Hi. Is this turned on? Okay. So uh, my name is Terry Egan. I'm from Educational Testing Service in Princeton, and um, I have a question that struck me as you were all speaking earlier because it, I was really thinking about current events and uh, growing up divided in this day and age. Have you considered the effect of education on the students involved? And I think you were just referencing it, Sarah. So for instance, a recent report on curriculum changes in the state of Florida stated that a concerted effort to reinvest in civics education over the past few years is what drove the recent high school student-focused political movement we've witnessed in Parkland. Do you think that the trend toward complacency is the result of STEM education crowding civics education out of the curriculum? And to value our rights in a democracy, don't we need to ensure that we are educating the citizenry? That's part of it. Yeah, I mean, there's been a collision, I would say this globally, about trends I've experienced and we have organizationally. One is STEM, for sure. Not that it's not important, but it shouldn't replace humanities, history, the second is history education has been crowded out, and it's often in history where some of these civics conversations happen, and, and should happen also. Um, and the humanities have too. Testing um, has also taken up an enormous amount of space. Um, and professional development. One of the things that I've seen is where teachers might spend a week doing something intensively over the summer or another, another time. They are more in school doing PD, it's tied to the school. If schools are segregating, that's a real problem. 
because then you have um, these, you know, single identity communities often doing PD in, on site. Uh, so there's been sort of a perfect storm, I think, of these different factors. And I've also seen teachers go from being active curriculum developers into curriculum delivery um, after this real moment of creativity uh, 10 years ago, where I would say teachers were more in the curriculum development space. I guess the other thing that, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how relevant are our results collected a few years ago versus now, um, because kids are out there and active and everybody is really excited about that. And I'm not sure whether compared to South Africa and Northern Ireland, the results would be any different for the US. They might be or they might not be. And I think that's, that's really an open question. One of the things that, that strikes me is that we tend to see protests when people feel threatened whoever they are and whenever that happens. And um, we were talking yesterday about the fact that protest is a part of civic action, but it's not the only thing. And it doesn't always go along with really understanding deeply the threats to democracy. Now, the other thing that's happened in, since Trump has been elected, have, a, a lot of anti-Trump people have talked about threats to democracy quite explicitly. And that's one of the things that has taken up more space in the news in, and so, so there, you know, lots of different forces going on that could um, affect how kids are thinking, and we really don't know the answer. And, and one last thing, there was an interesting um, report on Holocaust education last week, and um, some of the findings are, are very disturbing, especially for the United States. But you might remember that 14 years ago, in 2004, there was an active anti-genocide movement with Darfur at the center. And um, I think that there's some soul searching we have to do in this country about uh, is this a country that becomes excited and engaged only in opposition? Um, or is it possible to uphold democracy when, and movements such as anti-genocide movements, um, at moments when times feel good and you have people who are saying the right things and supporting you and, and, and so on? So the other panels. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple of different responses to your question. Um, I want to, we're spending a lot of time on this question, which is great. I, I'm going to just say that uh, if I flip the switch and I play the role of program evaluation guy, which is what I do for facing history and ourselves in my other world, um, I've seen incredible uh, evidence that not only facing history can work, but other approaches can work in helping teachers, especially it, uh, professional development approaches that integrate with the best practices in PD to help teachers to engage students in ways that can be very difficult to do without proper preparation. And so I think we don't know about the Florida case and whether or not civic, you know, professional development for teachers around civics in Florida is making the difference. I'm curious why those students have seemed so much more ready to engage in these ways. Uh, just like you, I'm extremely curious about that. But I really think high quality professional development is one piece of the of the puzzle. So just one follow up on the floor is I'm really intrigued by this question and have been thinking about it quite a bit. It seems like A, we don't really know. So when I read that same article, it really worried me. I just thought that we, that was way ahead of the data. But some possible answers might be that Florida is one of the few states that has a high stakes middle school civics assessment. And as a consequence, there's been a huge amount of civics in middle school, which as was mentioned before, in many other places, civics has been taken out of elementary and middle schools. Although we don't have any evidence that civics is taken out of high schools, as a matter of fact, more states are requiring civics now than 10 years ago. But you know, middle school is a really important time, and it may be that Florida is starting with that middle school approach really that has made a difference. The other thing is that the county um, that the young uh, people in Parkland lived in, Broward County, is the only county in the United States in which all kids are required to participate in debate. And, uh, and it's not, you know, usually debate is something in the United States now and in many other countries, it's reserved for the elite. And you don't see very many kids participating in debate. And in Broward County, all kids are participating in debate. 
And we, we think that there that might make a difference. It's at least for those of you looking for a dissertation topic, you know, this, this is a great question. And I think we really need to get not only in the United States, but into other places with these great examples of things that seem to look really good and try to get underneath them and figure out why. Let's go to another question. Go ahead and go to the mic, please. I'm Elaine, a doctoral student from Singapore. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, my question is, um, I would appreciate hearing any of your comments regarding whether the way the curriculum was designed, did it contribute in any way towards um, creating more you know, empathetic learning experiences for the students? Yeah, so my question is more from the design of the curriculum perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when we were designing the study, um, we specifically chose to work with facing to work together because facing the history has a robust curriculum for teaching civics, and it basically is a study of civic development. And in my theories of development, development doesn't happen all by itself au naturel. It has to have some kind. Of, there has to be some kind of support to go along with this kind of development. And so we didn't. We couldn't study development if we were in a space where there was no kind of curriculum that was trying to support that development. So we chose a space where there would be support for development so that we could begin to understand it and begin to understand and unpack what of the curricular uh, pieces were most effective um, and were kind of most robust. So the curriculum absolutely matters. And I think, um, as Dennis said, teachers' preparedness to actually teach about these things. One of the things that um, our subjects talked a lot about was, especially if they're confronting their difficult histories, they're not talking about civics in the abstract. It's, it's civics here where I live, right? Civics in the world, um, civics in light of your inheritance. For an educator in South Africa, white, black, colored, to deal with those things, they have to grapple with their identity, who they are, their inheritance, what it means to be an adult citizen, and then what it means to teach this stuff to a young person. And um, that's true in the US, it's true in Northern Ireland as well. And that's hard work. It's not just learning something, teaching it, it's wrestling with it, thinking about the implications of it for yourself. And um, in many ways, carrying the weight of these things while you're still living that history. Just to add to that, I mean, to make it use explicitly the word pedagogy, I mean, that it's not just the materials or what curriculum looks like, but how it's engaged with and how it's used. So these issues that, you know, of identity that, that Karen just referred to, you know, uh, need to be introduced in a way that allows for constructive engagement um, and learning to take perspectives. The same with debate. You know, how debates are done, you know, can vary, you know, it just, so I think there's a lot of skill involved, um, in, and I think that teachers um, can do, can obviously do a great job with it, but support, need certain supports at times to, to do it uh, in a way that's conducive to going this deep with these kinds of controversial issues. So I want to turn to Zina for a moment. As a developmental psychologist, I'm interested in your current work about the world development of young people and what you see in this study uh, from a developmental psychologist's perspective that is worth noting to the group. So I'll maybe I'll I'll try to keep it short um, <clears throat> and maybe just uh, circle back to what um, what Sarah and I were presenting in the in the last piece about um, about importance of micro supports and macro supports. Um, what I have noticed working for so many years on, on, on this study is that, and what I think is important to underscore and that all, um, almost uh, often gets um, sort of sidelined as a point that is almost too obvious, that um, young people are always engaged in reasoning. They are always deliberating. Whatever, uh, whatever the circumstances they're in, whether they are supported or not supported, whether they're in a, 
uh, peaceful or uh, liberal democratic society or otherwise, whatever their environment, they are always, always trying to gauge what their place is in that environment and they're always trying to decide um, what is going on and what is the, um, the best co course of action. And from, sort of from my particular moral development training, I've also noticed that um, kids do um, weigh very different, um, different aspects of, a, of every situation in trying to decide what is the best, uh, what is the best thing to do. So in terms of civic um, development, I think in particular, which is a, a, a particular kind of development that we're talking about here, um, this idea of supports, of different kinds of supports becomes very important because it sort of reflects on also how the environment is supported to development of, um, of a young person in terms of larger school structures, social structures, things that help kids reflect on the sort of larger environment. And also the micro supports that sort of very individually and on very individual and um, personal basis um, support the kids along the way um, um, in sort of literally sort of teachers kind of holding their hands and sort of um, um, buoyant. I have one final question about the quantitative part of the study. So one of the things that I love about this project is it's an example of mixed methods at its best. So it wasn't parallel studies, one qualitative and one quantitative, that at the end were being combined. It was clear that these two were speaking to one another throughout. And I'm very um, interested in what uh, was a finding from the quantitative part of the study that uh, Jaron, you or Dennis, you found just really surprising. It was like, wow, we didn't expect that. You want to? Um, I think that we we had thought more um, there'd be more of a connection between uh, the racial identity group, um, where I guess one thing I would say rather than surprising helped us to think through with the qualitative work, which is that. The, the dominant groups in, politically uh, in South Africa and the U.S. are interesting in contrast because in, in South Africa they've gone through apartheid that then became democracy where the majority became in power, um, whereas in the U.S. Um, you know it's sort of the reverse. And what we found is that um, there's uh, differences in civic dispositions that kind of seem to reflect that, but we un were able to unpack that. Um, through the qualitative work, and I don't know if you want to speak to that. Those of you who've been more deeply involved in the qualitative work, I'm going to have to cut you off on that. You will get to speak to that, but it'll be after the session. Okay. Um, so it's great news to hear that there's a book coming out about this. I know you're doing a lot of other writing as well. I want to make a pitch for those of you who are doing uh, civic development research to really take a look at the uh, scales that were developed. I mean, I think some of the development work that was done on both sides, quantitative and qualitative, is really exceptional and is going to move the field forward beyond this study. So um, again, it is my, my great pleasure to have been part of this session. I want to congratulate you on a really amazing study. I want to thank the other people who were in the room who were involved in this study and thank all of you for coming. So please join me in thanking our panelists.